I'm standing now at a 3D med pelvic trainer. This is the kind of pelvic trainer that I use to build my laparoscopic skills. We use the pelvic trainer and not the time in the OR because there should not be a patient's life at stake while you're building your skills. This is a low pressure scenario in which learning is maximum and optimal. So I am using the pelvic trainer, but I have it situated exactly like the patient is on my operating room table. The video comes through the patient's umbilicus. I am situated on the patient's left. Why is that? Well, because I'm right-handed and the physiologic motion in suturing is to suture towards your own midline, which would mean suturing uh, in, uh, towards the vagina on a patient by standing on her left. If you are left-handed, you'd want to stand on the patient's right. Now, I use a diamond configuration in the patient's abdomen, and so I've created the diamond configuration on the pelvic trainer. Adjust your height. Raise your height by adding lifts at the table. I almost always use a lift, even though the table is as low as it'll go, and so adjust the table down. My patients are always in steep Trendelenburg at 33 degrees, so that all the intestines fall to the upper abdomen, and so that I'm working clearly and cleanly and nicely in the pelvis. So this is the position where I'm standing straight, my elbows are by my side, my trapezius is not strained, and I hold my uh, non-ratcheting grasper in a loose fashion, and I hold mine upside down compared to everybody else. I think a lot of other people would hold it like this, but look at the strain that it's gonna create. So I use my Care Fusion grasper in a non-ratcheted fashion to pass my knots, and my ratcheting hand on the needle driver. I use a ratchet on my needle driver because I definitely need to have a strong grasp of the needle so that it doesn't wibble wobble when I am suturing. So having reviewed the ergonomic basics now, we'll talk about the structure and the nomenclature, the name for the suture anatomy so that we will know what we're talking about when we're giving instructions. The needle, of course, has the pointy end and the hub end. We call it the hub because that's the end that is that holds the suture, and that's the end we use to wrap the suture around the needle driver with our non-dominant needle grasper. Now, between the hub and the tip is an area within the needle that we call the belly of the arc. When we're trying to wrap the suture around the needle driver in preparation for our knot, we put the tip of the needle driver in the belly of the arc because that way the suture can't wrap around it because it's next to the needle. You'll see what I'm talking about in the real life demonstration. So we're going to pick up the suture and we're going to close this pseudo vagina. I'm going to reach for the needle and I'm going to push it into the tissue, which helps me to orient it in a right angle. If I needed to, I could just pick up the suture and pull the needle into perfect position. Now I'm going to pick up the edge of the quote vagina. To overcome the lack of three-dimensionality in the pelvic trainer as well as during laparoscopy, I will simply use the side of my needle to show me when I have touched the tissue. Then I will back away from it and pass the needle with great precision. I'll pass the needle all the way through and without changing the orientation of the needle, my grasper will lift it. I'll hold the tissue with my needle driver and pull it through without changing the orientation. Now for maximum efficiency, I'll re-grab the needle in the exact sweet spot, which is about two-thirds of the way from the tip of the needle to the hub of the needle, and I will move the suture through the incision with both instruments maximally efficiently and in good control. I'll lift up the anterior lip of the vagina touch it, back away, and pass the needle through it, turning it all the way so that I can re-grasp it without changing the orientation. Stabilizing the tissue, I'll pull it through, and then I will re-grab with no wasted motion, 
and pull the suture through. Note that I left a very short tail, about two centimeters. So let's continue with this figure of N. We'll pass the suture through, pull it without changing the orientation. I will continue to roll it through. We will tighten it because you don't want to be pulling the suture through the entire figure of N. Touch the tissue to know exactly where I am and pass it through. Now we're going to tie the knot. I'll pull the suture through. We're going to tie the knot. Now, I will want to align the hub of the needle with my driver, so I'm just going to pull it towards myself. These are now parallel, and it will allow me to use the the needle to wrap the suture around the needle driver. I'll pull back to control where the wrapped suture goes. I'll keep it on the needle driver and then I will move forward and pick up the loose end of the suture. Now I will pull down the length of the needle to disgorge the knot from the needle and I'll pull away from the knot with the needle driver. And there we have tightened it. Now for the second knot, and I've placed a surgeon's knot there. In real tissue, I would place this suture back on the moist tissue to hold it there so that the, after I make my next knot, all I need to do is lunge forward to pick it up. But in this model in the pelvic trainer, we can't get this to stay over here. So I'll just leave it there and find it wherever it is. Now it happens that the hub of my needle is lined up perfectly, but if in the process of, t of pulling the knot tight it had changed, I would simply reorient it to point directly at down the length of the needle driver. I will wrap it once. Let's wrap it in the other direction since I wrapped it the other way first. I'll lunge forward to pick up the needle, and wouldn't it have been convenient if it was right there? We'll pull it down the needle and this will, and we will tighten our knot very nicely. Now anticipating future knots, I'm going to again put the loose end of the suture on the tissue and it still won't stay because it's still not moist. I can wrap one final time. I could lunge forward to get it, but I'll find it over here. Now in real life, if you do have to go moving around, Move the entire needle driver complex so we move together. We move together so that we don't disgorge our, uh, our tie. And then I'll pick up the loose end of the suture. And there's our third tie, placing it, not staying again. Okay, whoops. And this will happen in real life, it does to me. And our final fourth tie. We're going to pass the suture through the tissue now, and I'm going to show a running stitch. If we were closing the bladder, this running stitch would be the kind of uh, stitch that we would use uh, through one layer, uh, and then we would come back and suture in the opposite direction back towards our needle. So I will begin tying my knot now. I'm going to pull the hub of the needle towards me so that I can use it to wrap around the needle driver. One, two, there's a surgeon's knot. I'm going to pull this down and I will drop my needle in view and then tighten the rest of the knot. I'll disgorge it from my driver and tighten it down. I'm going to place the loose end of my suture where I want to pick it up and now Here's another way to tie a knot. I will hold the suture so that instead of the hub of the needle facing me, the suture is coming out perpendicularly from my needle driver and I will wrap again and go and get the other, the loose end of the suture and there is knot number two. And so I'll place it and again with the suture from the long end, 
pointing directly at me. I will wrap in the other direction. Now sometimes, I didn't leave myself enough room here, you might want to open the needle driver to give yourself a little traction as you begin your wrap. I will load it further back and now I'm going to have to give myself some slack as I go looking for the end of my suture. Found it and here's the rest of my knot. So I'm going to demonstrate that a, a little more clearly in this next one. I will give myself more slack this time and I will have the suture pointing at me as if it were indeed the hub of the needle. So I can wrap around it in a perpendicular fashion and then I can go and pick up the tail end of the suture. And there's my suit knot. Now if this were closure of a cystotomy, I would have an assistant on board to help me because it's important when you're closing a cystotomy to uh, have the uh, uh, tension maintained on the suture line so that there is absolutely no laxity. So I have now my needle in the needle driver. Is it optimal? It actually is. So what I'm going to do is pass this rapidly through and we're going to pretend to have closed a cystotomy which is mucosa to mucosa and then we'll show you how to tie the knot at the end of the cystotomy closure. I'm pulling it through, I'm re-grasping and then I'll use my other needle, my grasper, to help pass it through. So now I'm going to run, now see this needle is not optimally positioned. I'll take the needle driver, I'm sorry, the suture, and pass it, uh, move it until it's optimally positioned. Coming out, and then I'll go in the anterior opening of my cystotomy, and we will continue to run this, stabilizing the tissue, grasping it. I use the same technique over and over again. Let's free that up. If this were a cystotomy, one of my colleagues would be keeping this, tish, this under tension. Since it's just me, I will put it under intermediate tension so that I have a nice line of closure. It's going to come a little undone each time, and I will adjust the tension each time. And so we will pass it through. Maybe at some point, I, in, even in real life, I can get both bites at once. As you see me simulating, We'll tighten it again. This is a good suture line. This would be watertight, wouldn't it? And then we're coming to the end of our cystotomy. I'm going to take this bite. And now for the purpose of our demonstration, I'm going to go ahead and make and tie the knot. So I'll leave this a little loose. The last one, I'm going to line up the hub of my needle. I'm going to wrap it with a surgeon's knot. I don't have much left, so I have to get very close. And I'm going to now pick up, see how I've picked up the last suture. I'm going to disgorge this by pulling in a collinear fashion. I'm pulling with the needle in this direction. I'm sorry, with the grasper in this direction. I'm going to even assist myself by helping to disgorge that because I've left myself with very little. And I'm, there we go, finally. And so I have a little loop to tie on, but a little more slack finally this time. And I will wrap it again. And let's pull back, we'll get our loop. We'll get our loop. And we will disgorge the knot and we will finish closing our bladder. Now, one option you have after running this layer of the bladder would be to come back and imbricate this layer if you had so much more suture. But I would only do that if I had an assistant because that requires a lot more suture. To demonstrate extracorporeal knot tying, we're going to start with our extracorporeal knot pusher preloaded at the end of our suture. We use the full length of the CT1 suture. So I'll set this aside as I then take my suture and needle and we'll just pass it through the tissue. We'll take it in the quote unquote trocar and 
end, we will pass our stitch and then we will demonstrate the extracorporeal knot tying. So I'm going to grasp it in the sweet spot. I could either use the tissue to orient me or I can perfect it by checking the orientation by pulling the suture. We will pass it through as if we're doing our sacroculpopexy and then we'll pull the tissue, uh, pull the needle through the tissue. And now I will bring the needle out. As I pull the needle through, in order to be gentle on the tissue, I'm gonna support the tissue by placing my other, my grasper so that I'm not distorting the tissue. And so now, with the needle outside, I will begin to tie my knot using the extracorporeal knot pusher. Some call this a knot puller because that's another way it's used. So holding the suture in one hand, I will tie a one-handed surgeon's knot. Here's the other part. This makes it a surgeon's knot. And then we will pass the knot down by holding both sutures in a hemostat. And I will guide the knot down. And here's the portion where it can appear that we are not pulling. The knot is now going to go down, and I'll hold it just past the suit, the uh, tissue, and it's tight. I'll come back. Surgeon's knot is deployed, and then outside of the body, I will do a one-handed knot because we already have our surgeon's knot in position. I will use my hemostat. You'll probably use a smaller hemostat in real life. And we will pull the knot down. Now in this situation, I will toggle both ends of the knot uh, of the, t the uh, suture. And here you can see we're tightening the knot nicely. And so here in this situation, the knot puller pulled it, the knot in and we've got it tied down nicely. And so for our last stitch, we will tie one more simple stitch, simple knot, and we will, I'll use both of my hands, and this is perfectly legitimate too. You hold the suture as if it were like a marionette, and you pass the tissue, the knot down on the suture, and there we go. And we tighten it using both hands of the quote unquote marionette. So that's three knots with an extra corporeal. And typically in surgery, you will cut the needle off, but I left it on just for demonstration purposes. I'm going to demonstrate how to make a lasso so that you obviate the need for uh, actually even tying a knot. So holding a needle grasper or a needle driver will pass a loose suture on it and just tie a surgeon's knot. And then we will use this very suture laparoscopically for placing our uh, suture to close the vagina. To pass this suture in, we will hold the suture so that we don't lose the lasso portion. We'll pass it into the quote unquote patient's body. And here we've got our needle and we have our lasso knot loaded on to the needle driver. And so let's go ahead and we'll pass a stitch. I'm going to pick up the needle and you can see it's in the wrong orientation. So I will use my a suture to rotate it around 
and get the right orientation. Here we go. A lot of stitch here, but we're planning on doing a long running so we have a lot of suture. So we'll pass the suture through, say, the beginning of the closure of our cystotomy, and we'll pull the needle through the tissue, and then I will hold the suture, and then we will advance our lasso over our needle and pull it through the tissue. And this obviates our need for passing a knot. In this segment, we're going to deal with what happens when your needle breaks off, because it's going to happen. I'm going to pick up the tip of the long suture end and I'm going to hold it in the needle driver uh, with a very short end that's going to be easy to pick up. This is a little too short. Let me uh, give myself a little more slack here. There we go. I'm going to hold the excess suture behind me and I'm going to wrap the suture onto the needle driver. I'm going to hold it back so it wraps well above the loose end. Then I'm going to pick up the loose end, maintaining my wrap. I'll pull it back up and we will go, we'll travel together and pick up the loose end of the suture. We'll hold it close to the um, knot and then we'll tie it so our knot is not lost. Now we put a surgeon's knot in there so it'll stay and then we will repeat the same procedure in the other direction. We won't need to do a surgeon's knot. And I'm going to go, since I can, one wrap farther than I need to, so that this time when I pick up the end of my suture, I can take it off of the uh, end without worrying about losing my wrap. And there we go. Now here I've demonstrated something that I wish I wouldn't do. When you have a long tail, if you grab it less than half of the length, it's going to loop like this. So you must, when you grab a long tail, grab it more than 50% the distal half of your tail so that when you pull it through, it doesn't loop. We've covered suture passage through the tissue. We've covered knot tying. We've covered situations in which it's difficult to tie a knot. We've covered situations in, in which you even break your needle off. Now it's up to you. What are your next steps going to be? Well, one step would be to formalize your laparoscopic training by taking a course. We at the Laparoscopic Institute for Gynecologic Oncology offer our course twice a year, hoping that all of the 44,000 obstetrician gynecologists in the United States will start using minimally invasive surgical techniques. There are a lot of challenges in laparoscopic surgery. There's the pressure of doing what you need to do for your patient. There's the pressure of everybody seeing you on the cameras in the room. So you want to come to the operating room with a maximum of skill possible. You develop that on the pelvic trainers. You take a course in laparoscopic surgery. You begin your laparoscopic career with senior laparoscopic surgeons so that you can offer your patient your highest quality of care.